Hey guys. First meal of the day. Guys, welcome back to my channel. Happy end of the year. Sick of it. Done this year. Ready to be done. Ready for growth in a new 2022 because 2021 is it's getting old. I'm ready to move on. I'm okay. Spotify and Apple Music and stuff have done their wrapped. You know, what were your top music? What was your top song? My top artist was Playboy Cardi. Interpret that how you will. Time for a clarify round. What were my top 10 books of 2021? You know, last year I was baking when I did this. This year, I'm packing up to go home because I'm ready to go home. America's favorite sandwich cookie. This year I read more, I guess like Kindle Unlimited books than traditional novels, which doesn't mean that they're any more in like valid or invalid than each other, you know, just because it's a Kindle Unlimited doesn't mean it's not a book, you know what I mean? I don't really like that superiority thing that people have where it's like, oh, I read real books. I just noticed when I was looking through my Goodreads, I did happen to read a lot of those, which means that maybe I needed a little bit more, you know, fluff in my life, perhaps. It's been a trying year, I'm sure I did. Get through this top 10 and keep it trucking, all right? Yeah. Number 10 on my list is The Virgin Suicides by Jeffrey Eugenides. Um, this is a heavy, heavy one to start with. <laughs> um, so I decided that this was gonna be my, my 10th favorite book that I read this year because I think that, I think about it enough that it needs to be mentioned, but it wasn't like a favorite, you know what I mean? You know what's gonna happen from the title and literally from the first page. You know it's about the Lisbon sisters, all five of them who have committed suicide. Um, and you know all of that, the narrator tells you that, but it's really trying to figure out not even figure out, but just see why. It's very interesting to me because I remember in the foreword of the book, I don't remember it word for word, but they said it was like an elegy of the female experience. And I thought that, or female teen experience or something like that. You know, as I'm talking about it, why don't I look it up so I'm a reliable narrator? Well, there's a quote. It says, this is the quote. Um, it represents the boy's final elegy for the girls they loved. It says, it didn't matter in the end how old they had been or that they were girls, but only that we had loved them and that they hadn't heard us calling, still do not hear us up here in the treehouse, with our thinning hair and soft bellies, calling them out of those rooms where they went to be for alone for all time alone in suicide which is deeper than death and where we will never find the pieces to put them back together well basically the boys that are like obsessed with them don't interact with them that much they took them to prom but like that was basically it um but they become so fascinated with these girls and um i think that also really fascinated me because the narrator didn't have like a relationship with these girls at all but they were watching them kind of like animals in a way and they were watching them have these strict family and then kind of like, you know, the shock, everyone has the shock of them all killing themselves, Cecilia before the others, but all of them killing themselves at the same time. And so what, hearing it from a male gaze on these four girls of like, oh, why'd they do it? It's just so interesting because it's like a teenage boy's brain and you're like, critical thinking, why do you think? The next is Boom, Distancia de Rescate by Samantha Schweglin. I read this book in Spanish in one of my Spanish classes. Okay, follows these two women and one of them has a son named David. And we don't know if David is still really David because when he was little, he drank the same water that killed one of their horses um, because it was contaminated. And so the like really interesting part of the story that made me like it so much is that it combines the environmental horror in Argentina of the contaminated water and like just the pollution and all that stuff with like body horror and like psychological, like A24 type like discomfort kind of thing, like unnerving type beat. That's why I liked it. I'm moving this, sorry. But I had no idea what was going on the whole time and it freaked me out. And not just because it was in Spanish. I understood that part. It is just like the, ah, I'm uncomfortable. That was cool to me, I don't know. My number eight book. Nisha Dolan, I think, is really put in the Sally Rooney pipeline a lot of the time. People are like, oh, if you like Sally Rooney, then, you know, introduce yourself to this new author, Nisha Dolan. And fair enough. Um, their writing styles are pretty similar to me. It's not identical, but they're pretty similar. I could, I could, I definitely understand where the comparison comes in. Exciting Times is about this woman named Ava. Oh, my eyes itch so bad. These allergies are booming. Who is living in Hong Kong and she's Irish. And she kind of like lived, I think she lives with him. She is in this like quasi relationship with this white business banker named um, Julian. And then while Julian's away, she meets this woman named Edith who is Asian. And basically the book is split into Ava's time with Julian and her time with Edith. 
the uh, woman. And I just think that it's so interesting because the difference in Ava's narrative from when she's with the man versus when she's with the woman. I think when she's with the man, she centers herself around the male gaze and like male attention. Not in like a pick me kind of way, but like she just, the way she talks is, is different to me. And then with Edith, I think she was more liberated. And I think that that is just kind of a testament to Dolan's way of writing where I am not told, you know, she's more liberated with Edith, but you can tell through her mannerisms and the way she talks about the world and the way she interacts, the male gaze is really crushing her in. The book is My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Otessa Moshfig. Yes! I don't really know how to explain why. You can have all the money and all the time in the world. You're not guaranteed happiness because of that. Truly, the story is about nothing if you really want to get down to it. There's no like inciting incident, you know, that kind of thing. We're not taking on like a, an adventure ride. It's just a lady sleeping her way through a year. And that's, you know, a very shallow way of talking about this book. But overall, that's really what it is. Yet I was still so intrigued because Otessa Moshfabe just really has a really powerful talent for writing. And I had a good time reading it. She's just funny. The narrator was just funny. When she got bored and decided to poop on the floor, I said, go on girl, give us more. Like, yes. Number six is Normal People by Sally Rooney. Now, be easy, okay? I know this is kind of low, but it's okay. I love this book so much and I love Sally Rooney. This is the first book I've read from Sally Rooney and I just didn't, couldn't get enough. I could relate to both Marianne and Connell, not, you know, identically, but they definitely just were relatable characters. I still care so much about both of them and I cared about the relationship and I love a good, like, no one in this world gets me but you. There was a quote that I put in my review um, where they was talking about how they were like two plants in the same pot growing together, taking different positions around each other and I said, oh my honorable mention i haven't finished it yet i've got like 60 pages to go because you know life gets in the way of things sometimes but my honorable mention on this list is beautiful world where are you by sally rooney and i can't really say it's one of my favorite books of 2021 because i didn't finish it in 2021 i'm not going to probably or i don't know i might surprise myself i have a quote that i underlined in here that i think that's where the title of the book comes from but i just think it's the most beautiful thing in the world i was sitting half asleep in the back of a taxi remembering strangely that wherever i go you are with me and so is he and that as long as you both live the world will be beautiful to me ah. it's really nice when you find an author that just kind of speaks to you you know there's the way they write the way they create characters just kind of speaks to what you like and that's sally rooney for me so Love you, queen. Ah. Number five is Passing by Nella Larson. Ending is kind of annoying. Um, I can agree. Passing surrounds two women um, who are both white passing and one chooses to live her life as a black woman and one chooses to assimilate into whiteness, has a very racist white husband who doesn't even know she's black. Like, it's great. Thinking. On a census, it's a social construct, okay? Are you black because you present to the world or are you black because of what your parents look like? You know, that kind of thing. Very interesting conversation to be had. A powerful, larger conversation to be had about what it means to be white passing, what it means to be black, what assimilation is, like, spin. Four is Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler. Now this is another book that I read for class, but I already had it on my bookshelf because I wanted to read it anyways. So it's just exciting that it's part of the curriculum. The of the Sower surrounds Lauren, who is a young girl in a dystopian California, a dystopian United States. Um, and basically it's kind of, I guess coming of age. She just deals with living in this dystopian world. Um, a lot of bad stuff happens. And um, she's also starting her own religion. I'm dumbing it down insanely. Octavia Butler is such an incredible science fiction writer. Like just so amazing. I'm not the first person to say that, obviously. We all know that she's, you know, the one. I'm mad that it took me so long to read this, but I'm glad that I didn't read it before I read it with the class because I think I would have missed a lot of the things that we discussed as a group. Someone who doesn't really read science fiction, I, you got me, you know, you got me. I like this one a lot. All right, number three on my list is Never Let Me Go by Cosmo Ishiguro. Surprised? No. I can't tell you why it's dystopian. I just simply can't because it spoils the whole story. But <sighs> you know what's gonna happen to these people and they know what's gonna happen to these people, but they still find 
such such joy in the sadness and I think that's why it broke me so bad. This is a big spoiler warning. The fact that they're clones and they know that they're clones and they know that they are literally made to be organ donors yet they still like want to feel, they want to live, they want to have all these experiences. Knowing their fate is just really, really heartbreaking. <laughs> Number two on my list is Deals with the Devil and Other Reasons to Riot by Pearl College. So this book I actually fear is out of print. I was opened up to a lot of stuff I think that I hadn't really thought about in detail pre-reading this. Um, I read it like February, I think, and I was really fascinated by it because I started reading it at the same time as I started attending a women's college that is also an HBCU, so I'm in the environment, you know? Talks a lot about black femininity and the politicizing of women's bodies, the politicizing of blackness, and how being a black woman in that intersectionality is just, you know, something you can't not acknowledge. Um, the entire section about Miles Davis, I'm on his head. Um, I already knew that Miles Davis, like, was an op, but now I'm like, oh, <clears throat> mm. Number one, my favorite read of 2021 is The Perks of Being a Wallflower by Stephen Chbosky. Ah, it's not a happy story, uh, per se. It's really not. It, it is full of reality. A lot of bad things happen to a lot of the characters in the story. But what makes it my favorite read and what made me tear up when I read it again at my job the other day is that there was um, like a 20th year edition in 2012 that came out where Chbosky wrote like an afterword by Charlie. So the entire novel is told through Charlie sending letters to this anonymous person. He says like, dear friend, and then he signs it off, love always, Charlie. Um, I don't know if you notice, but in the descriptions of my videos, I write love always Claire, and that's because of Perks of Being a Wallflower. I'm just a biter. You know how it goes. The letter that Charlie wrote in the afterword combined with the story was just so insanely powerful to me because it talks about basically just depression and loneliness and how he was saying that like the letters that the friend had sent him over these last 20 years has kept him going. And if you've ever wondered, where's Charlie been? How's he grown up? Is he okay? He has three words for you. He made it. Reading Charlie talking about how trauma occurs and, and it doesn't discriminate, it happens to everybody, but you have the choice of either letting it fester in you and turn you into something else and, and you can perpetuate the cycle of being a monster or you can be better and, and pay good things forward. Really retained that and took that in because Charlie obviously faced some really horrific things and the people around him faced really horrific things. But he decided to understand what happened to him and, and try to grow and try to not let that determine who he is. I swear we were infinite. So that's my list. Um, and I think that this was a really good year of me reading. I got a lot of stuff off my list that I wanted to read. Um, obviously these are only my top 10. I, I like a lot more books. I'm done. I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, let me know. Okay, what was your favorite read of this year? I really do want to know um, because I'm trying to read more in 2022. Is that going to work? I don't know. We'll see. Thank you so much for watching. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you next week. Bye. <laughs>